Section 1 of Astounding Stories 05, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 05, May 1930. Into the Ocean's Depths. A sequel to From the Ocean's Depths by Sewell Peasley Wright. Part 1. I read the telegram for the second time. Then I folded it up, put it in my pocket, and pressed the little button on my desk. My mind was made up. Miss Fentress, I'm leaving this afternoon on an extended trip. The Florida address will reach me after Thursday. Tell Wade and Bennett to carry on. I think you have everything in hand. Is everything clear to you? Yes, Mr. Taylor. Miss Fentress was not in the least surprised. She was used to my sudden trips. The outfit got along perfectly without me. Sometimes I think my frequent absences are good for the business. The boys work like the devil to make a fine showing while I'm away. And Miss Fentress is a perfect gem of a secretary. I had nothing to worry about there. Fine. Will you get my diggings on the phone? I hurriedly put a few papers in place and signed a couple of letters. Then Joseph was on the wire. Joseph, pack my bags right away, will you? For Florida. The usual things. Yes, right away. I'll be leaving by noon. Yes, driving through. That was that. There were a few more letters to sign, a few hasty instructions to be given, regarding one or two matters that were hanging fire. Then on my way to the bachelor apartments, I read the telegram through again. Think it worth while if you feel adventurous and have nothing pressing to come to the monstrosity. Stop. Make your will first. Stop. Shall look for you any day, as I know you're always looking for excitement and never have anything important to do. So don't bother to wire. Stop. Perhaps we shall see her again. Mercer. I smiled at Mercer's frank opinion of my disposition and my importance to my business. But I frowned over the admonition to make my will, and the last telling statement in the wire, perhaps we shall see her again, I knew whom he meant by her. Joseph had my bags waiting for me, a few hurried instructions, most of them shouted over my shoulder as I was purring down the main drag, my duffel in the rumble, and the roadster headed due south. Perhaps we shall see her again. Those words from the telegram kept coming before my eyes. Mercer knew what he was about if he wanted my company when he put that line in his wire. I have already told the story of our first meeting with the strange being from the ocean's depths that, wounded and senseless, had been flung up on the beach near Warren Mercer's Florida estate. In all the history of civilization, no stranger bit of flotsam had ever been cast up by a storm. Neither of us would ever forget that slim white creature swathed in her veil of long light golden hair as she crouched on the bottom of Mercer's swimming pool and pictured for us by means of Mercer's thought telegraph my own name for the device he has a long and scientific title for it with as many joints as a centipede the story of her people they had lived in a country of steaming mist when the world was very young they had been forced into the sea to obtain food, and after many generations they had gone back to the sea as man once emerged from it. They had grown webs on their hands and feet, and they breathed oxygen dissolved in water as fishes do, instead of taking it from the atmosphere. And under the mighty Atlantic somewhere were their villages. The girl had pictured all these things for us, and then, nearly a year ago now, she had pleaded with us to let her return to her people, and so we had put her back into the sea, and she had bade us farewell, but just before she disappeared, she had done a strange thing. She had pointed under the water, out toward the depth, and then, with a broad sweeping motion of her arm, she had indicated the shore, as though to promise, it seemed to me, that she intended to return. And now Mercer said we might see her again. How? Mercer, conservative and scientific, was not the man to make rash promises. But how? The best way to solve the riddle was to reach Mercer, and I broke the speed laws of five states three days running. I did not even stop at my own little shack. 
It was only four miles from there to the huge, rather neglected estate, built in boom times by some newly rich promoter, and dubbed by Mercer the Monstrosity. Hardly bothering to slow down, I turned off the concrete onto the long, weed-grown gravel drive and shot between two massive stuccoed pillars that guarded the drive. Their corroded bronze plates, bearing the original title of the estate, the Billows, were a promise that my long, hard drive was nearly at an end. As soon as the huge, rambling structure was fairly in sight, I pressed the flat of my hand on the horn button, and by the time I came to a locked wheel halt, with the gravel rattling on my fenders, Mercer was there to greet me. It's ten o'clock, he grinned as he shook hands. I'd set noon as the hour of your arrival. You certainly must have made time, Taylor. I did, I nodded rather grimly, recalling one or two narrow squeaks. But who wouldn't with a wire like this? I produced the crumpled telegram rather dramatically. You've got a lot to explain. I know it. Mercer was quite serious now. Come on in, and we'll mix highballs with the story. Locked arm in arm, we entered the house together and settled ourselves in the huge living room. Mercer, I could see at a glance, was thinner and browner than when we had parted, but otherwise he was the same lithe, soft-mannered little scientist I had known for years, dark-eyed, with an almost beautiful mouth outlined by a slim, closely cropped and very black mustache. Well, here's to our lady from the sea, proposed Mercer, when Carson, his man, had brought the drinks and departed. I nodded, and we both sipped our highballs. Briefly, said my friend, this is the story. You and I know that somewhere beneath the Atlantic there are a people who went back to whence they came. We've seen one of those people. I propose that, since they cannot come to us, we go to them. I've made preparations to go to them, and I want you to have the opportunity of going with me if you wish. But how, Mercer, and what? He interrupted with a quick, nervous gesture. I'll show you presently. I believe it can be done. It will be a dangerous adventure, though I was not joking when I advised you to make your will. An uncertain venture, too, but I believe most wonderfully worthwhile. His eyes were shining now with all the enthusiasm of the scientist, the dreamer. It sounds mighty appealing, I said, but how? Finish your drink, and I'll show you. I downed what was left of my highball in two mighty gulps. Lead me to it, Mercer. He smiled his quiet smile and led the way to what had been the billiard room of the billows, but which was the laboratory of the monstrosity. The first thing my eyes fell upon were two gleaming metal objects suspended from chains let into the ceiling. Diving suits, explained Mercer, rather different from anything you've ever seen. They were different. The body was a perfect globe, as was the headpiece. The legs were cylindrical, jointed at knee and thigh with huge discs. The feet were solid metal, curved rocker-like on the bottom, and that the ends of the arms were three hooked talons, the concave sides of two talons, facing the concave side of the third. The arms were hinged at the elbow, just as the legs were hinged, but there was a huge ball and socket joint at the shoulder. But Mercer, I protested, no human being could even stand up with that weight of metal on and around him. You're mistaken, Taylor, smiled Mercer. That is not solid metal, you see. And it is an aluminum alloy that is not nearly as heavy as it looks. There are two walls, slightly over an inch apart, braced by innumerable trusses. The fabric is nearly as strong as that much solid metal, and infinitely lighter. They work all right, Taylor, I know, because I've tried them. And this hump on the back, I asked, walking round the odd, dangling figures, hanging like bloated metal skeletons from their chains. I had thought the bodies were perfect globes, but I could see now that at the rear there was a hump like as crescents across the shoulders. Air, explained Mercer. There are two other tanks inside the globular body. That shape was adopted, by the way, because a globe can withstand more pressure than any other shape, and we may have to go where pressures are high. And so, I said, we don these things and stroll out into the Atlantic looking for the girl and her friends? Hardly. They're not quite the apparel for so long a stroll. You haven't seen all the marvels yet. Come along. 
He led the way through the patio, beside the pool in which our strange visitor from the depths had lived during her brief stay with us, and out into the open again. As we neared the sea, I became aware for the first time of a faint, muffled hammering sound, and I glanced at Mercer inquiringly. Just a second, he smiled. Then, there she is, Taylor. I stood still and stared. In a little cove cradled in a cunning, spidery structure of wood, a submarine rested upon the ways. Good Lord, I exclaimed. You're going into this right, Mercer? Yes, because I think it's immensely worth while. But come along and let me show you the Santa Maria, named after the flagship of Columbus's little fleet. Come on. Two men with army automatics strapped significantly to their belts nodded courteously as we came up. They were the only men in sight, but from the hammering going on inside, there must have been quite a sizable crew busy in the interior. A couple of raw pine shacks, some little distance away, provided quarters for, I judged, twenty or thirty men. Had her ship down in pieces, explained Mercer. The boat that brought it lay to offshore, and we lightered the parts ashore. A tremendous job, but she'll be ready for the water in a week, ten days at the latest. You're a wonder, I said, and I meant it. Mercer patted the red-leaded side of the submarine affectionately. Later, he said, I'll take you inside, but they're busy as the devil in there, and the sound of the hammers fairly makes your head ring. You'll see it all later anyway, if you feel you'd like to share the adventure with me. Listen, I grinned as we turned back to the house. It'll take more than those two lads with the pop guns to keep me out of the Santa Maria when she sails, or dives, or whatever it is she's supposed to do. Mercer laughed softly, and we walked the rest of the way in silence. I imagine we were both pretty busy with our thoughts. I know that I was, and several times as we walked along, I looked back over my shoulder towards the ungainly red monster straddling on her spindling wooden legs, and towards the smiling Atlantic, glistening serenely in the sun. Mercer was so busy with a thousand and one details that I found myself very much in the way if I followed him around, so I decided to loaf. For weeks after we had put our strange girl visitor back into the sea from whence Mercer had taken her, I had watched from a comfortable seat well above the high water mark that commanded that section of shore, for I had felt sure by that last strange gesture of hers that she meant to return. I located my old seat and I found that it had been used a great deal since I had left it. There were whole winnows of cigarette butts, some of them quite fresh, all around. Mercer, cold-blooded scientist as he was, had hoped against hope that she would return, too. It was a very comfortable seat, in the shade of a little cluster of palms, and for the next several days I spent most of my time there, reading and smoking and watching, no matter how interesting the book. I found myself every few seconds lifting my eyes to search the beach and the sea. I'm not sure, but I think it was the eighth day after my arrival that I looked up and saw for the first time something besides the smiling beach and the ceaseless procession of incoming rollers. For an instant I doubted what I saw. Then, with a cry that stuck in my throat, I dropped my book unheeded to the sand and raced towards the shore. She was there! white and slim, her pale gold hair clinging to her body and gleaming like polished metal in the sun, she stood for a moment while the spray frothed at her thighs. Behind her, crouching below the surface, I could distinguish two other forms. She had returned, and not alone. One long slim arm shot out toward me, held level with the shoulder, the well-remembered gesture of greeting. Then she too crouched below the surface that she might breathe. As I ran out onto the wet sand, the waves splashing around my ankles, all unheeded, she rose again, and now I could see her lovely smile and her dark glowing eyes. I was babbling, I do not know what. Before I could reach her, she smiled and sank again below the surface. I waded on out, laughing excitedly, and as I came close to her, she bobbed up again out of the spray, and we greeted each other in the manner of her people, hands outstretched each gripping the shoulder of the other. She made a quick motion then with both hands, 
as though she placed a cap upon the shining glory of her head, and I understood in an instant what she wished, the antenna of Mercer's thought telegraph, by the aid of which she had told us the story of herself and her people. I nodded and smiled, and pointed to the spot where she stood, trying to show her by my expression that I understood, and by my gesture, that she was to wait here for me. She smiled and nodded in return, and crouched again below the surface of the heaving sea. As I turned toward the beach, I caught a momentary glimpse of the two who had come with her. They were a man and a woman, watching me with wide, half-curious, half-frightened eyes. I recognized them instantly from the picture she had impressed upon my mind nearly a year ago. She had brought with her on her journey her mother and her father. Stumbling, my legs shaking with excitement, I ran through the water. With my wet trousers flapping around my ankles, I sprinted towards the house. I found Mercer in the laboratory. He looked up as I came rushing in, wet from the shoulders down, and I saw his eyes grow suddenly wide. I opened my mouth to speak, but I was breathless, and Mercer took the words from my mouth before I could utter them. "'She's come back?' he cried. "'She's come back? Taylor, she has?' He gripped me, his fingers like steel clamps, shaking me with his amazing strength. Yes, I found my breath and my voice at the same instant. She's there, just where we put her into the sea, and there are two others with her, her mother and her father. Come on, Mercer, and bring your thought gadget. I can't, he groaned. I've built an improvement on it into the diving armor and a central instrument on the sub. But the old apparatus is strewn all over the table here just as it was when we used it the other time. We'll have to bring her here. Get a basin, then, I said. We'll carry her back to the pool, just as we took her from it. Hurry. And we did just that. Mercer snatched up a huge glass basin used in his chemistry experiments, and we raced down to the shore. As well as we could, we explained our wishes, and she smiled her quick smile of understanding. Crouching beneath the water, she turned to her companions, and I could see her throat move as she spoke to them. They seemed to protest, dubious and frightened, but in the end she seemed to reassure them, and we picked her up, swathed her in her hair as in a silken gown, and carried her, her head immersed in the basin of water that she might breathe in comfort, to the pool. It all took but a few minutes, but it seemed hours. Mercer's hands were shaking as he handed me the antenna for the girl and another for myself and his teeth were chattering as he spoke. Hurry, Taylor, he said. I've set the switch so that she can do the sending while we receive. Quickly, man. I leaped into the pool and adjusted the antenna on her head, making sure that the four electrodes of the crossed curved members pressed against the front and back and both sides of her head. Then hastily I climbed out of the pool, seated myself on its edge, and put on my own antenna. Perhaps I should say at this time that Mercer's device for conveying thought could do no more than convey what was in the mind of the person sending. Mercer and I could convey actual words and sentences, because we understood each other's language, and by thinking in words we conveyed our thoughts in words. One received the impression almost of having heard actual speech. We could not communicate with a girl in this fashion, however, for we did not understand her speech. She had to convey her thoughts to us by means of mental pictures which told her story. And this is the story of her pictures unfolded. First in sketchy, half-formed pictures, I saw her return to the village of her people, her welcome there, with curious crowds around her questioning her. Their incredulous expressions, as she told them of her experience, were ludicrous. Her meeting with her father and mother brought a little catch to my throat, and I looked across the pool at Mercer. I knew that he, too, was glad that we had put her back into the sea when she wished to go. These pictures faded hastily, and for a moment there was only the circular swirling as of a gray mist. That was the symbol she adopted to denote the passing of time. Then slowly the picture cleared. It was the same village I had seen before, with its ragged, warped, narrow streets and its row of dome-shaped houses for all the world like Eskimo igloos, but made of coral and various forms of vegetation. At the outskirts of the village I could see the gently moving, shadowy forms of weird submarine groves, 
and the quick darting shapes of innumerable fishes. Some few people were moving along the streets, walking with oddly springy steps. Others, a larger number, darted here and there above the roofs, some hovering in the water as gulls hover in the air, lazily, but the majority apparently on business or work to be executed with dispatch. Suddenly, into the midst of this peaceful scene, three figures came darting. They were not like the people of the village, for they were smaller, and instead of being gracefully slim, they were short and powerful in build. They were not white like the people of the girl's village, but swarthy, and they were dressed in a sort of tight-fitting shirt of gleaming leather, shark skin I learned later. They carried, tucked through a sort of belt made of twisted vegetation, two long slim knives of pointed stone or bone. But it was not until they seemed to come close to me that I saw the great point of difference. Their faces were scarcely human. The nose had become rudimentary, leaving a large blank expanse in the middle of their faces that gave them a peculiarly hideous expression. Their eyes were almost perfectly round and very fierce, and their mouths huge and fish-like. Beneath their sharp jutting jaws, between the angle of the jaws and a spot beneath the ears, were huge longitudinal slits that intermittently showed blood red, like fresh gashes cut in the sides of their throats. I could see even the hard bony cover that protected these slits, and I realized that these were gills. Here were representatives of a people that had gone back to the sea ages before the people of the girl's village. The coming caused a sort of panic in the village, and the three noseless creatures strode down the principal street, grinning hugely, glancing from right to left, and showing their sharp pointed teeth. They looked more like sharks than like human beings. A committee of five gray old men met the visitors and conducted them into one of the larger houses. Insolently, the leader of the three shark-faced creatures made demands, and the scene changed swiftly to make clear the nature of those demands. The village was to give a number of its finest young men and women to the shark-faced people. About fifty of each sex I gathered to be servants or slaves to the noseless ones. The scene shifted quickly to the interior of the house. The old men were shaking their heads, protesting, explaining. There was fear on their faces, but there was determination, too. One of the three envoys snarled and came closer to the five old men, lifting a knife threateningly. I thought for an instant that he was about to strike down one of the villagers. Then the picture dissolved into another, and I saw that he was but threatening them with what he could cause to happen. The fate of the village and the villagers, where the demands of the three refused, was a terrible one. Hordes of the noseless creatures came swarming. They tore the houses apart, and with their long, slim white weapons they killed the old men and women and the children. The villagers fought desperately, but they were outnumbered. The shark-skin kirtles of the invaders turned their knives like armor and the sea grew red with swirling blood that spread like scarlet smoke through the water. Then this too faded, and I saw the old men cowering, pleading with the three terrible envoys. The leader of the three shark-faced creatures spoke again. He would give them time, a short revolving swirl of gray that indicated only a brief time apparently, and return for an answer. Grinning evilly, the three turned away, left the dome-shaped houses, and darted away over the roofs of the village into the dim darkness of the distant waters. I saw the girl then talking to the elders. They smiled sadly and shook their heads hopelessly. She argued with them earnestly, painting a picture for them. Mercer and myself, as she viewed us, tall and very strong, and with great wisdom in our faces, we too walked along the streets of the village. The hordes of shark-faced ones came, like a swarm of monstrous sharks, and the picture was very vague and nebulous now. We put them to rout. She wished us to help her. She had convinced the elders that we could. She, her mother and father, started out from the village. Three times they had fought with sharks, and each time they had killed them. They had found the shore, the very spot where we had put her back into the sea, then there was a momentary flash of the picture she had called up, 
of Mercer and I putting the shark-faced hordes to rout. And then, startlingly, I was conscious of that high, pleading sound, the sound that I had heard once before when she had begged us to return her to her people. That sound that I knew was her word for, please. There was a little click. Mercer had turned the switch. He would transmit now. She and I would listen. In the center of the village, how vaguely and clumsily he pictured it, rested the Santa Maria. From a trap in the bottom, two bulging, gleaming figures emerged. Rushing up, a glimpse through the faceplates revealed Mercer and myself. The shark-faced hordes descended, and Mercer waved something, something like a huge bottle, towards them. None of the villagers were in sight. The noseless ones swooped down on us fearlessly, knives drawn, pointed teeth revealed in fiendish grins, but they did not reach us. By dozens, by scores, they went limp and floated slowly to the floor of the ocean. Their bodies covered the streets. They sprawled across the roofs of the houses, and in a few seconds there was not one alive of all the hundreds who had come. I looked down at the girl. She was smiling up at me through the clear water, and once again I felt the strange, strong tug at my heartstrings. Her great dark eyes glowed with a perfect confidence, a supreme faith. We had made her a promise. I wondered if it would be possible to keep it. End of part one.